I think mathematicians are probably uh, just one step below dentists in terms of how they are hated uh, because uh, you know you tell someone that you're a mathematician at a party and they say well that's very nice I always hated mathematics <laughs> and and then I, I usually start giving them absolution you know go in peace my child uh, because you don't need that or something like that culture is really what what I'm after here uh, and the reason is that mathematics is something that you don't see much in cultural discourse. I mean, it's something that really has a hard time getting into the culture. And uh, there are several quotes that, uh, I, I don't think I have them in this talk, but you know, there's a wonderful quote that uh, Rob Feiner, who was a former editor of the New York Times, had to say. He said that the reason we don't, uh, we don't really publish mathematical stories in the New York Times is because math has no emotional content. And whereas physicists still tell you what it means to be alive and what it means to be human, math mathematicians can't do that, so we don't really bother about that. And so there's this whole thing about culture. How does one bring mathematics into the popular culture? And that's a big problem because what happens is that uh, you know, people have these negative attitudes about mathematics. They don't have any kind of way to really experience it in a cultural milieu. Uh, and then that's passed on to children. So it's really important to target adults. How, how does one make, motivate people uh, with mathematics? Interestingly, I, I've been talking a little bit to the Maryland Science Center, and they said the first thing they told me was, if we ever do anything related to mathematics as a show, we don't put the word mathematics in it, because that'll scare people away. <laughs> so, so there's this whole image problem. I mean, uh, mathematic, mathematics really needs a good publicist. The talk is actually going to be divided into two parts. The first part will actually talk about what are the ways that, mathema that mathematics is more, uh, how do people try to motivate mathematics? You know, especially, you know, these cultural kinds of motivations. Uh, and what are the problems that one encounters in that? I'll, I'll give you a whole bunch of methods that people use, and you'll see that, you know, all of them have problems. And the second part, will be to take one idea and really show you how it can be done, how I think it would actually work. So here is the talk, uh, and this is the first part, motivating a mathematics talk. Wow. So this is my first approach, and watch out for the sound effects, you know, if you have a pacemaker or something, shut it off, or whatever you're supposed to do. Uh, so, so the first I call the shock and awe approach, and here, uh, this is used, uh, this, everyone in this room has probably seen this, has encountered this, where you, you're basically bombarded with all these things that, math, that, that math is good for. You know, you wouldn't, without it, you wouldn't, have, uh, you wouldn't have buildings, and you wouldn't have airplanes or computers, and you wouldn't have energy, you wouldn't have electricity, trains, whatever, radio, energy again. That's the reaction you get, the yawn. And so, you know, no matter how much you bombard people, uh, there's this part of them that says, okay, fine, so what? Uh, and then, you know, being a professor, uh, the natural reaction is something like that. Okay, you've got all these students, they're playing with their cell phones and everything. Uh, so that's, that's, what a prof that's, that's what people start doing, but that doesn't work either. Okay, so, so what's another approach? This is my second approach, and this is, this is usually used with school kids, you know, lower, uh, lower grades perhaps, uh, the pennies in heaven kind of thing. And the idea here is you tell them that, okay, you might not need this right now, you know, but it's good for you. <laughs> you know, you should, you should study these uh, linear equations because once, once you grow up, uh, this is what you'll need for your for your bright future. That, that's, that's opening up, right, as we see. Uh, and of course, what, 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 is the, what is the reaction to that? So a pretty similar reaction. Uh, what else can we do? So 
this is, this is pretty much what the New York Times was talking about. Every once in a while, you'll actually see an article where they pull apart something, you know, I don't know, cell phones or energy or something, and they tell you exactly how this works, and they try to motivate mathematics that way. Like how, and the idea is that, okay, people are used to using a cell phone, so they'll be interested in finding out how it works, how, what, what goes into that. Unfortunately, people are not interested in finding out how it works. Uh, they're really interested in just using it, and thank you very much, they don't need to know more than that. And so, of course, if you have some sort of mathematician who's actually trying to explain this, pretty, pretty soon you'll be hearing things like amplitude and voltage and resistance, uh, and then, you know, mathematicians, you'll see some sine function drawn there. Uh, we'll start talking about the wave equation, and pretty soon you'll see some gibberish like that, and that'll, that'll be the end of it. Uh, and as, as the mathematician is going on, blabbing away about how this works, you now get something even worse, people screaming as they leave. So this is the next approach, and uh, <laughs> and I call this the macho approach. And the idea here is math is something that's really you know, it's, it's going to do things that not, no other subject can, that it, it really, you know, it's really the, the most um, abstract, the most uh, uh, refined form of brain activity. It's completely pure. Um, I think was, uh, was the uh, motto that, uh, the slogan that Plato had over his, over his uh, entrance to his academy. And interestingly, I think for a while, the American Math Society had something like that as their motto. So it's, it's uh, I mean, this is really, you know, it works pretty well, this kind of thing. It works for a segment of kids, for instance, people who are naturally inclined to this kind of stuff. But for a lot of people, this is completely frightening because uh, this really turns people off. I mean, it's basically telling you that, okay, if you can't do this, you aren't smart. And that's not a good equation to have. Uh, someone who really uh, came up with this, you know, Hardy, he, he had a book called A Mathematician's Apology. And he did everything but apologize in that book. Uh, what, what, what he said was that there were two things about math that he really liked. One was the purity, the fact that it was so difficult and that only a few people could do it. And the second was that it was useless, that it was completely <laughs> useless. And uh, he said that, Math that is applicable often gets very ugly, and he doesn't like that. And of course, that was a different time, and you know, he, he did a lot of stuff that was applied as well. But uh, in the intervening years, and especially nowadays, it's really the more applied math that is, uh, that is really essential. So anyway, this is, this is an approach that, again, uh, works for a few people, but doesn't work in general. And, uh, Actually, that, that second stream is now math anxiety. That first one is the people running, but the second stream is math anxiety, which, which is a big problem. I've seen it in, uh, in classes that I've taught here at UMBC. We have a course that's uh, um, one of the math courses that every student has to take if they aren't a math major. And uh, you know, some of the things, some of the people that, I encounter, that I've encountered there really have a severe problem with this kind of anxiety. And so this approach doesn't help. So, so this, is, this is the exact opposite, the sort of new age approach. And uh, what you have here is you know, a lot of mumbo jumbo that unfortunately you see, in, you see all over. Uh, and, and I'll give you an example of some of this stuff. Uh, I hear that uh, Deepak Chopra, I don't know if you've seen this, I was, I was reading a book recently and I found that, and I was very pleased to learn that he has actually uh, proven the existence of the soul using quantum physics. 
<laughs> so, but, but it's this kind of stuff, you know, you, you mix a little bit of math, you mix a little bit of physics, you talk about a lot about uh, the Heisenberg, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you talk about Godel's incompleteness theorem. These, these terms are bandied about uh, and applied uh, quite, uh, quite uh, uh, to, to things that they have no, no application for. Uh, so, so let's let's go on. This this also doesn't, you know, it doesn't it doesn't have the rigor that is needed. This this uh, Apostolos Doxiadis is a mathematician. He's the one who came up with this term, the paramathematics approach, and. Um, I don't know, have, and his idea was that, okay, there's a lot of math that you do see in the cultural milieu. For example, there are a lot of movies, there are books, there are plays about math, and he said that uh, through this, the public gets some idea, not so much about mathematics perhaps, but at least about mathematicians, and that helps with their ideas, their feelings towards the subject, and that can be one way of making inroads. So has, has anyone, this is a book that he wrote, in, uh, has anyone read this book? Uncle Petros and Goldbach's Conjecture? Uh, he's the author of that book. And of course there are some of these movies. Uh, has anyone seen these movies? What's common in all three? So there's a mathematician in all of them, and uh, he basically goes mad in all of them. And uh, that's, that's the problem. Uh, there's a rule by Chekhov that says, you know, if there's a gun in a play, it has to go off in the third act. <laughs> Corollary is that a mathematician has to go mad. And, and this is something I see a lot. When you, when you uh, give Hollywood any chance to do something with mathematicians, that's the first cliche they like. Uh, so there's this whole thing about, okay, there's a thin line between mathematics and madness, and let's pull in the public that way, and you know, create this mystery, this persona of mathematicians teetering. In fact, this is so successful that uh, this is something uh, that really happened to me last year. I went to, I was going to Bombay, to Mumbai, and I was going to give a talk. Uh, I have this talk on infinity that I'll be talking about in a second. And uh, I was going to give this at the American Center, which is run by the U.S. government in Mumbai. And, um, they told me that, okay, well, this talk is too mathematical. Can you, kinda, can you make it a little easier to understand, easier to relate to? And they said, they gave me a list of things that I should try and relate to so that the audience would be pulled in. And this was the actual question number three that was on that list. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I was, a, you know, I was a little... I didn't know what to respond, but I finally said, well, I haven't gone mad yet. Uh, and that was, you know, when I went there, no one, no one brought this up. They didn't ask me for further evidence of my sanity. Um, but anyway, uh, the, this whole idea of paramathematics, uh, I want to advertise something uh, that, that I have on YouTube. And uh, this is, I figured that before we come to the main talk, we should have a little trailer, so, so I made something for you. And um, I pulled out all the stops for the good stuff. Let's see, why don't I use this? So there are a lot of, this is something that we actually did uh, in a first year seminar here at UMBC. Some of the students actually helped make this. And uh, it's a long trailer. So, so the nice thing about that is that it has, it's already got about 10,000 people who have watched it on YouTube, which is quite amazing. Uh, and if you decide to watch it, you can actually download it from the UMBC streaming media. That gives you a much better picture. Okay, so those are all the approaches that don't work. 
let's see what I'm going to actually do today. So this is, this is my approach. And I call it the Trojan horse approach. And what I'm going to do is, I'm, I'm actually pretending that it's a talk on writing. And that's how I'm going to fool people, hoodwink people into listening to me. So uh, here is the talk finally, and it's the mathematics of fiction. That's the name of the talk. The reason why I had this uh, kind of bucolic scene of this um, conference that I went to way back in 2000, um, and that's because I was, I've been at some uh, book readings a few times, and people have actually gotten up and asked me questions like, okay, well, what, what do you guys, what do, you, what do mathematicians do at a conference? Do you, do, you know, do you have lunch hours and do you talk to each other? Or they, they had no idea, and so this actually shows us eating lunch and you know, things like that. <laughs> Uh, interacting like normal human beings. Uh, so, so this was, this was uh, way back in April 2000, and uh, what happened there was very interesting. <laughs> this is, this is uh, Professor Yuhani Pitkaranta, uh, a colleague of mine, and he came up with this, with this interesting statement and let me give you a little bit of context. Um, my book was just about to come out the next year, and people knew that I'd written a novel, so they asked me to do a reading for, from the novel uh, during one of the lunch hours. And after that, he came up with a statement, which he said that writing a story is like creating a Fourier series. And he mentioned this idea of using the right basis functions. And now, uh, someone who's not a mathematician obviously looks at these things, Fourier series, basis functions. And the question is, what did he mean by that? And so I'm going to explain a little bit about that. And uh, let's, see, let's see what Fourier series are, first of all. And uh, you've all probably seen this idea that sounds can be represented by waves. And uh, for example, let's see if I can get this. Uh, in uh, audio components where you hear a mu some music and you can see the wave representation. Uh, and the wind, too, I, I'm not going to show you that again, but that also has a different kind of wa wave motion that goes along with that. Uh, it turns out, as we shall see in the next few slides, that these waves are actually made up of some very simple components. And these are what I call the basis functions. So let me, let me show you some more slides to really bring this idea out. So let's say that this is your, you know, this is the wave that you get from that frequency analyzer for, for the sound you just heard. And let me show you these very simple four waves. So you'll notice that these are really very different in nature from the top one, in the sense that these are undulating very evenly. Uh, the first one is very slow, and the second, third, fourth are faster. But they're very even, and they're very uh, measured in that way. Well, notice what happens if I stack all these four waves, one on top of the other. So I've just stacked them, one on top of the other. Notice what you get on the top. What is the outline that you see on the top? The outline that you see on the top is exactly the wave that we started with. And this is graphically expressing a simple idea that the top wave is actually the sum of the lower four waves. So that the top wave can be actually broken down into the sum of these very simple waves. And uh, these individual simple waves are called basis functions. Whenever you're deconstructing something into simpler components, the simple components are called basis functions. And this idea actually comes up in sounds. You know, let's say, let's say that I have, I have some music that's going on. I can again take that music this, this top wave represents the music, and uh, those are the simple components. I can actually break it down. But I should stop, because we don't want to hear how things work. So that's, that was the screaming again. But, but on a larger scale, uh, let's, let's say you have different instruments. Thank <laughs> you. 
So all sorts of wind instruments. Here are the flutes and oboes. And then uh, obviously we need some drums. And if you put them together, what, what happens is that the actual, uh, I'm going to turn this, let's see. So an orchestra is also made up of components. And the components in the case of an orchestra are just going to be the individual instruments. You can see that even better in the following slide, where uh, I actually took a score from some um, orchestral piece. And again, if you look at this score, you'll actually see each of the components, the banjo, the vi viola, and so on, uh, the scores for each of them are listed right at the same order. And those are actually corresponding to those simple components that are called the basis functions. So this is a natural analogy which occurs with orchestral pieces. Well, let's go on to imaging or images. If you look at any image and blow it up, you'll see that it really is made up of pixels. So any image, you know, we all know, looking at a computer screen, for example, blowing it up, you get pixels. If you look at the pixels, you'll notice that each pixel consists of a red, a blue, and a green component. And the reason is that, you know, you can make all these other colors from this. But it's really the intensity of these three components that determines what your picture is going to be. So, when you have a picture, it's really the intensity of these three pixels. And this music is a bit loud. So, so really, it's the intensity of those three components that are the basis functions for an image. Uh, because depending on what you make those three intensities, you'll get different pictures. You're all familiar with these. And this is, of course, the painter Seurat. And really, what his pointillism was all about was, in some sense, doing the same thing. He was looking at these individual pixels. And you can see that even better in this picture. And he was basically finding basis functions for painting in some, in some weird way. So this, this deals with imaging. We looked at music. We looked at waves. Pitkaranta, though, talked about something else. He was talking about fiction. And the question is, is there some analogy for these basis functions in fiction? Well, let's say there was one. What would these components be? If you had some story that was this more complicated wave, what would the individual components be? Anyone want to guess what, I mean, what components would you have for a story? Plot, characters, uh, and plot components, you know, like love and murder, uh, and characters. You'd have to have a hero. Uh, someone, someone pointed out that that was a little sexist to make heroin have the, and you need a villain, of course. I'm actually going to turn the sound down somehow, if I can. And it turns out that the answer is yes, there are basis functions for fiction, or someone has come up with analogies for that. And this was a Russian, uh, Russian uh, 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 professor, actually. He was at a university, Vladimir Prop. Way back in 1928, he wrote a book called The Morphology of the Folktale. What he did was he, he looked at about 100 different Russian fairy tales. And he found that all of them could be decomposed into the same 31 plot components. And depending upon which components were activated, you got different stories. These components always came in the same order. Not every story had all of them. 
but they always broke down into the same 31 plot components. Uh, and he even called these functions, and uh, I think I have a list of these. And the interesting thing is that he also showed there were only seven major character types. Uh, now these ideas uh, work best when, when you really restrict the kinds of fiction you're looking at. So he only looked at Russian fairy tales. But these kinds of ideas are used quite a bit in uh, all sorts of computer programs. There's a whole artificial intelligence area of automatic story generation, but, but more useful than that uh, there is, uh, there is you know, video games where you have various fantasy roles that the player, that the viewer is going to be, be playing. And for that, you really need to know what the possible ways the story can progress are. You need to break it down into components and you need to program them in. Uh, concerning props components, though, let me show you an interesting uh, website that I found. And this is something at Brown University where they've actually listed all 31 pro plot components, you can actually generate a story. So does anyone want to tell me what plot components they want? Uh, what would you like? Uh, villainy. villainy. OK, let's check that. What else? Liquidation. Liquidation. Oh, <laughs> violence. Where is that? Right there. Uh, rescue? OK, so let's, let's, let's take one more. Exposure. Well, you, you click the ones that you want, and then you say generate, and it actually gives you a story. <laughs> and if you want, you can, you, can, uh, you can click some other things, and you can get a different story. Uh, let's, let's, let's end with a wedding. So, and you get another story. So uh, if, you, if you really go to this website and look at how it works, it's, uh, it's actually quite elementary. But uh, the idea is that, this kind of idea has been used in more, in more complex ways, let's see, more sophisticated ways. And uh, as I mentioned, video games is, is one place that you really need that. Interestingly enough, uh, this has also been used a lot in Hollywood. And Apostolos Doxiadis, the person I mentioned, uh, points this out in an essay where uh, You've probably heard about this book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. Um, he looks at myths throughout the world and sees the basic building blocks of all these myths. Uh, this was something that George Lucas claims was really helpful in developing the Star Wars screenplays. And Stanley Kubrick actually handed a copy of this to Arthur C. Clarke when he was writing 2001, A Space Odyssey, the screenplay of that, and said, you know, here, this will help. Uh, there's another book. Uh, the writer's journey, where uh, it's actually the same ideas, but really used in terms of Hollywood screenplays. I mean, specialized to that case. And the Matrix series is supposedly inspired in part by that. Uh, and there's this wonderful thing that I came across where all stories are supposed to be quest stories. And if you look again, you know, if you, if you think your story is not a quest story, a successful story, look again, and it will be a quest story. That's supposed to be the dictum in Hollywood more than anything else. OK, so, uh, so that, was, that was the fiction part. I'm going to conclude with one more example uh, of this idea of basis functions. And we're going to look at smiles. So you have all these different smiles, these different expressions. And what I want to do is I want to find a way of modeling all these different expressions. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Supposing you have some face, a smiley face, for example, a computer animated face. 
And you want to actually have these expressions on that face. And, and you want more than that. Perhaps you want this, this expression to actually change from one to another. Uh, you know, you want to make it do all these things, but you also want it to, to in a way, if you, if you change it fast enough, it'll look like that thing is talking. That's, that's the basis of animation. So I want to see how this can be done using this idea of basis functions. So to do that, I'm going to make a simplification first of all. So I have this smile there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose nine points along this smile. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw little lines between each of these pairs of points. And then the third step is to get rid of the smile and only look at what I have left. So I had those nine points, I connected them with little lines, straight lines, and then I forgot about the smile. And then what I'm going to say is, OK, I'm not interested in the actual curves, you know, a perfectly curved smile. I'm willing to make do with something like this, where instead you have this piecewise linear smile. You have this piecewise line type smile. And you can do that with any expression. Let's say you have some other expression like that. I'll again put nine points through it. I'll again draw these little lines. And I'll forget about the actual expression. And I'll say I'm satisfied with something that looks like this. And you know, third one, again draw the lines, forget about the actual expression. We are interested in these approximations to the expression. Now notice what happens. If you look at this expression, uh, it's really completely determined by the blue dots. You know, you put those blue dots in, you join them, and that's how you get the expression. And what happens is, if you change the positions of the blue dots, then you get another expression. For example, you have a smile now. Uh, once again, I'm going to get rid of those lines, change the expression. All I need to do is move the blue dots, and I get a different expression. So everything is really determined by the positions of those blue dots. And you can change one expression to another just by changing where the positions are. Notice that we've actually solved our problem, even though it's a little hard to see right now, we have our basis functions. All these expressions are generated just by the blue dots. So depending on where they are, you'll get a different expression. And you can control what the expression looks like just by moving these dots up and down. And so these dots have now given you complete control over this expression, and they are your basis functions. Let's see this, let, let's see this in a slightly more a mathematical way. And notice I haven't had any numbers so far, so you'll allow me to do that in these last couple of slides. So I'm going to actually draw these coordinate axes where I'm going to number these dots from 1 to 9, and then I'm going to draw the vertical side just tells you the height of each dot. So the first dot is 20, the second dot is, you know, this could be in inches and in centimeters, whatever. So I've assigned a height to each dot. And now notice that since each dot now has a height, this complete expression really is just the sequence of numbers now. You just need to list the heights of each of the dots. You don't even have to draw them. You just list the heights. And that, that 20, 27, 32, 36, whatever, it actually specifies the positions of the dot and therefore the entire expression. If I change those uh, numbers, I'll get a different expression. You know, change the numbers again to something else. Let's say they're all 29s, I just get this straight expression. Uh, change it again, and I get something else. And finally, I would get a smile. Though that's, the, that's the code, the sequence for a smile. Uh, change it to something random, and you get some sort of, I don't know, peanuts type expression, Charlie Brown. Uh, and so each expression corresponds to a sequence. Each sequence gives me an expression. Here's something very interesting. Let's say I've listed all these sequences on the top. I start with the one on the top, and then by rapidly going through them, it almost looks like this thing is moving, that it's a mouth moving. Well, you kind of have to uh, imagine a little bit. But there it goes again. Well, that was, that was the mouth actually moving. So that's the birth of actually giving rise to something 
which is animation that will be more convincing. Now so far we've just looked at this smiley face thing, but let's say you actually have a mouth. How would you actually model a mouth? You know, every, people don't go around with just a smiley face. They actually have lips and teeth and everything. But let's take the next step and try to model a mouth. Well, what you would do as a first step is rather than using just one line, you would now use four curves. And notice that will give you some sort of idea of what the mouth looks like. You would actually have lips now. And this is my very amateurish uh, attempt at animation. But I'm going to actually make Marilyn blow you a kiss. So here goes. There. That, that's, that's it. So uh, that's, so, 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 well, you might still object, though. And you might say, well, you know, that, that, that somehow doesn't look like Marilyn's smile. This is a $9 smile. That's what I call it. They're nine points. Uh, if you want a million dollar <laughs> smile, you're going to have to use a lot more basis functions. So the more effort you put in, uh, the better your smile will look. And I got tired, so I didn't put all the dots in. But the more dots you use, the closer you'll be able to approximate the lines of her lips. And so let me just summarize all these points, uh, and don't scream. You know, so what we saw was that the building blocks, you know, this idea of breaking something down into building blocks, works in fiction, in music, images, even in animation. And the idea is that you break something down, find its basic building blocks, and then use those in some combination to recreate new works. Now this, this is something that occurs all over, and it has a very mathematical analog, which, which we actually teach in Math 221. Uh, but it's another way, it, it's a much more uh, concentrated way that you would encounter in a mathematical course, but it's the same idea. And the questions, the kinds of questions that mathematicians would ask would be, first of all, are all these building blocks, are all these basis functions really necessary? Uh, for example, you know, consider the example of the pixels. Well, supposing that I put in an extra yellow pixel. You know, why don't we have a yellow pixel as well? Well, what happens if you put in a yellow pixel is that you have something extra there. We know that in terms of light, red and green make yellow, so the yellow pixel is unnecessary and actually spoils your decomposition. There, there, there are too many ways of decomposing it. And therefore, you don't really need it. Uh, because we need building blocks that are completely independent of each other, and the yellow isn't. So that's why that doesn't work. Uh, the other kind of question that mathematicians would ask are whether the basis functions are enough. Do you have enough of these basis functions? Uh, for example, you know, if you look at the smile with nine dots, and you throw out one of them, then that's not so serious for the smile. That still looks pretty reasonable. But if you look at that expression, you can't do it. And so for all the expressions, you know, if you want to be able to have some tooth up or down, you would need them. Uh, let me give you a better idea of how that works. There's the Mona Lisa. If you look at her smile, whether you use eight or nine dots, it's not going to make too much difference in that one line because it doesn't change so much. It's very, it's very subtle, but it doesn't change too much. But let's say, let's say you take a pumpkin and you try to draw a Halloween face on it. That's what you would get if you had nine points. But if you had eight points, that's what you would get. And that's the best you would be able to do. You wouldn't be able to get that final tooth in there. So that's the kind of thing that you would need. Mathematicians would actually be able to, you know, this kind of problem comes up in huge contexts where you have uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of basis functions. And there you really need to do some analysis before you can answer these types of questions, whether they are enough basis functions or whether they are too many basis functions. So this is what. I, I, I realized that you know, prop had those different uh, 31 plot components. This whole talk that I've been giving actually s 
eerily enough fits into his framework. And here's what, what I came up with. So, uh, first one was that the hero is introduced, and I'm the mm -hmm. hero in this case. Uh, the second was, you know, there's this interdiction that is issued to the hero, and in this case it was discussing math in public. You get those yawns as usual. Uh, interdiction is violated, you know, try to do it in public. The villain is the failed approaches of math outreach, which I showed you in the beginning. The heroine is actually all of you. Uh, and you have to be won over with this kind of uh, outreach. <laughs> Screaming at the mention of math, the, the whole thing about meeting someone at a party and then going to uh, replenish their drinks. So there's always got to be a magical agent. <laughs> and uh, I think sound effects really help wake people up, so, so that worked. The direct combat between the two. You did stop screaming. Uh, this is this is also interesting. I, I I've been you know reincarnation as a writer, and that's how I approach this subject now. It's very hard to get away from all those ideas that people still keep using to propagate mathematics. <coughs> Okay, and uh, we're trying to get, I don't know, Angelina Jolie or someone to, <laughs> to star in this. So, so thank you very much. Uh, hope you like that. I'm wondering if uh, the idea of uh, writing a story with the various um, uh, points has ever been reversed in which you have a story and you do uh, literary analysis uh, to uh, describe it and uh, uh, critique the story. Has anyone ever taken it and reversed it? I think people have. I think you know, there's this whole thing about deconstructionism, and that, that's what that activity is. I'm not an expert at it, but uh, I have seen. I think, I think for example, just that a book by Joseph Campbell essentially does that, where he's looking at different myths <laughs> and uh, looking at what, what you know, trying to describe each myth in terms of those building blocks. And also the book on screenplays, I forget his name, but he does that. He does that with about 40 or 50 uh, movies, that some of which you would have seen. And he fits them all into this cycle that, uh, that is followed in all these success, successful screenplays. Depressing in a way because you think, well, no, nothing new is ever going to be. Well, yeah, well, yes and no, because I think this kind of stuff works best for uh, very simple types of fiction, uh, genre fiction, and uh, you know things like screenplays. They have to really uh, follow a set pattern to be to be the most uh, most successful in terms of drawing audiences. But I think uh, more literary types of fiction, people have perhaps know this on a subconscious level, and then they try to break this. They, they try to avoid falling into this cycle. And I think that's where it's useful that, okay, you know what the general form is, and then you try to make different types. Uh, the other thing, of course, is this automatic story generation uh, using artificial intelligence. I've, I've seen some stories so far, I haven't been convinced that they can make them that interesting. But you know, I don't know where that will go. But I do feel that uh, I, I don't think that, well, I don't know, but I, I don't think that it'll be easy to replace uh, authors by computers. I don't think so, but might be wrong. Yes. The um, TV show numbers, I think, is yes. a good uh, popular uh, way of introducing math to people, although sometimes it's, it's pretty complex. It's sometimes very complex, and um, often it's, um, I mean, I, I, there's a book, actually, which looks at all the plots and numbers and looks at the math behind them. And, uh, you know, again, it's, it's the question of how deep can you go. And you can't go very deep, but you're right. It really helps uh, paint a very good, positive portrait of mathematicians. Very few people going mad on that show. And, uh, 
and they're very attractive, like all mathematicians are, as we know. Uh, but, but, but that's the kind of thing that does work, I think. Uh, the only thing is, and there are websites which will actually, where school kids can actually log in and look at the math behind it in much more detail. So that's great, that's perfect. You know, you, you use the show to actually spark some interest, and then people who want to read more can really look on the show, on the website. Yes? You talked some about math having a PR problem, and I thought that was fascinating because in some of the work that I do, and some of the work that my students are doing too, we're taking issues of grammar to teachers, K through 12 teachers, and people often have the same PR problem with grammar and screams and, and reactions about that. And then I started thinking, and some of the issues that we've also been dealing with is maybe there's always a bit of a PR problem when you're taking academia out in terms of outreach into the public. And maybe I was wondering if you could talk some about some of your successes and failures, how you've reached out and who you've partnered with and what those experiences have been like. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I mean, I was, ta I was mentioning this uh, talk on infinity that came up in the first year seminar that I taught quite some years back. And one of the projects we had was that uh, the students had to, we, the, the basic topic of the seminar was math in the media. And uh, the project was to create something that we could use with non-mathematical audiences to motivate them. And so the students and I actually came up with uh, this PowerPoint presentation uh, on infinity, explaining it and, um, to, to, to people who would not know anything about math. And the interesting thing was that this is something that is only taught at a very high level in Math 301, which is only for math, you know, people who are math majors. Uh, but you can actually explain it quite interestingly enough to, we, we actually went out and even uh, went to some eighth graders. And since then I've given it in several uh, contexts. I, I was invited once to the Berlin uh, Literature Festival some years back. And uh, you know, they asked me to give a talk and I told them I'm going to give them a math talk. And they had four classes of German kids, school kids from the 10th and 11th. Uh, who, who were actually in the language class. They were learning, they, they just read my book, but here they were subjected to this math lecture. And they actually liked it, uh, at least they said they did. And they asked questions, and they sat throughout the whole thing. Of course, they were German, so uh, that helped. <laughs> uh, so, so, I mean, I've had some successes with that. Uh, and the schools are always interesting. They're always challenging just because, uh, well, that's a whole different issue. Just, you know, getting anything done in middle and high schools is very difficult because you have to have strong lungs to talk very loudly over all the stuff that is going on. Well, thank you again. Well, thank you so much.